Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure we welcome Mr. Ray Hildebrand, also known as Paul, of the famed group Paul and Paula. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Paul, it's good to be here. From one Paul to another Paul, it's, it's wonderful to be talking to anyone about the past. I don't know that I'm a genius about the 50s and the 60s, but I did live it, so I've got lots of stories to tell. So tell all the listeners out there, where were you born, and uh, what was life like growing up? I was born in and around uh, Fort Worth, Texas, which is uh, just to the west of Dallas, and uh, in a small town called Joshua Way, which spelled like the, the book in the Old Testament. Uh, they pronounce it Joshua Way, not Joshua. But I was born to a couple of school teachers there back in 1940 in November, and I uh, was the baby of four children that they had, Walter and Alma Hildebrand, and my life was a pretty simple life growing up, raised in the church, uh, in this case a Baptist church in different places. Just a good, good, simple life, wonderful parents. We were poor, but everybody was poor, Paul, in those days. <laughs> so what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Back in those days, uh, in the 40s and the early 50s, at least where I lived, there were no divisions of country and western rhythm and blues and pop and all that stuff, uh, classical. It was all on one station. I got a good smattering of everything, you know, but most of it was uh, simple country stuff, I would say, what we would call country, and some kind of just regular popular stuff, so... So when did you take listening to music as a fan and decide that you wanted to do music yourself? When I was in junior high and in high school, there were people who sang. And when I would be out working with my brother or my mother and father in the car going across the country, they sang. And so I started listening. And on Sunday nights, I would hear harmonies and stuff in church. And I started practicing those and and uh, singing along with the radio, uh, Hank Williams and I began to do that, and so it wasn't long before somebody said, hey, would you like to sing in church? And uh, one of my friends was a song leader at this church, and I said, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I wanted to be somebody. So <laughs> I got up there. I only started over three times, Paul, but, hey, it was the beginning, and so if you're going to make a mistake, make it in front of your friends and your family. So I started doing that, and I started singing around. Me and another guy would get together and harmonize like the Everly Brothers, and so it just kind of slowly began, but mostly I think it began in church, you know, listening and hearing all the wonderful harmonies and everything, both on Sunday morning and on Sunday night. Well, when you started to sing on your own and started to kind of develop your own identity, was there anybody, bands or singers, that you thought were especially an influence? There were some people that I really uh, enjoyed listening to. I listened, I really enjoyed Tennessee Ernie Ford. I really enjoyed... Uh, one of the songs just before we had Hey Paula was a song called Hey Baby, which was by a guy out of uh, McKinney, Texas, named Bruce McMeans. They changed his name to Chanel, and he, I loved his voice, and I loved his songs. And Stuart Hamlin out of uh, California wrote a song, It Is No Secret What God Can Do, and, and uh, those kind of songs. Uh, I loved Hank Williams' songs. The day I passed you on the street and my heart fell at your feet, I can't help it if I'm still in love with you. Those are great songs. <laughs> I, I loved uh, the, so many of the country singers. Uh, I, I would say uh, the guy out in California, Stuart Hamlin, had one of the biggest influences on me. I loved his music. So, Well, tell us about the formation of Paul and Paula. When I was in college at Howard Payne College, a small uh liberal arts school out in West Texas. I played basketball on the on the college basketball team. One of my friends during the summertime that the girls all went back home on all our dates and he didn't want to lose his girlfriend Paula so he wanted to have a little song he could sing her to keep her uh, keep her close so she wouldn't date the nearest back home and so he said, Would I write a song for his girlfriend named Paula? And so I said I would and so I did that and uh uh Annette Funicello of Mickey Mouse Club fame had a song called Tall Paul that was being played at the singing pool where I was the lifeguard and and I decided to have a, a the boy sing back to the girl in my song so I guy's name was Russell that asked me to do the song so I I put Paul in, from that song in place of, of Russell and it really worked the Paul and Paul thing worked and as I tried to write this song, though, I, I had a problem with, uh, you know, really putting in the true love stuff. But I had just broken up with the love of my life, a girl named Judy. And so I just, I was uh, kind of heartbroken about that because I really liked her. And But the 
time wasn't right for us to get together, and, and she had gone back. She was a friend of this Paula, and so I uh, I just used the feelings that I had for missing Judy and put it in that song and, and used the Paul and Paula idea from uh, Annette Punicello's song and from his girlfriend that he asked me to write the song for, and so it, it all came together, and that's how it happened. So Once the song was recorded, what happened from there? You know, the song... You hear it still on the radio. I hear it. It's also been yeah. in some movies. How did it go from you recording it? What happened next? I look back now, and I've, one of these days the book is going to be released, and it has all of this in it, but you're jumping the gun. But on it, when it was all finished, and the mother of the girl that I had been singing with in college some, she came by one day with her husband and with the girl, and the step was when the song was finished, a girl came up to me, at, at the swimming pool where I was working, and her name was Jill, and she said uh, she was a singer, a local singer, and she said, would I help her on a little radio show but that she had access to at this little station? And I said, I played the guitar, and she said she didn't want to do it by herself. And I said, okay. So we went, and I had this song written. I mean, it's like a step-by-step. I look back, and I just like a God had this, had a plan for us in this whole thing. So... We started singing this song on this little radio show. A DJ started playing our little song with uh, Frank Sinatra and Bruce Chanel and all the others on the top 40 just because he liked it, and he thought it was a cool thing, a boy and a girl talking about their love right over the airways. And then one day the mother and her came by with her daddy, and they said, we got the, we got this guy that produced this song called Hey Baby, and when he's up in Fort Worth, we, we're going to go and show him our song, this song we got, and so we're going to see if there's anything there. So... We drove up there, and as fate would have it, a black guy didn't show up for a recording session that this guy was having. This major Bill Smith was his name, and so we were standing there, and he said, what do y'all want here? And we told him, and he said, well, let's go do it. So we walked in there and and sung the song, and the next thing you know, and about with his promotion and stuff, it came out on... uh, on Phillips or Mercury Records about three or four months later. Uh, well, we as a couple went from fan to famous in about three or four months, and it took off. They changed our name to Paul and Paula, changed the name of the song from what it was to Hey Paula, and that's the song that you hear 47 years later. <laughs> it did come fast, and as I said, we went from fan to famous in about three months, and uh, if you don't have your life together, you're not going to get much of a break from anybody else. I mean, in our case, it just took off. And when you have a number one song, that means it's being played a lot by a lot of different stations. A lot of songs get up to number 30 or something like that, and they're maybe they're not being played that much, but ours was being played a lot, especially on the East Coast up in uh, New York and all of that, where 500-mile radius of Buffalo, New York, is half the population of the United States, and that's that's where our our song was a hit. And It was tough. You got treated like a spoiled king, you know, all over the place. Everybody came to you with autographs and all. This was back, uh, you know, before computers and cell phones and all that kind of stuff. You know, in my case, I was a Christian guy, and I I had some help from God. I I don't know how people make it, I mean, because you just can't believe your press clippings. If you you start believing what everybody says about you, you're the greatest thing it ever was. (laughs) (laughs) But it's tough. So, It's really admirable, I guess, just being level-headed. You have to feel a little bit special. At least that song has made such an impression. I want to tell you a real quick story. I was backstage. I was at a a Jack Johnson concert, and he has this singer that's uh, going out with with him named Paula Fugal. And uh, so they introduced me. They said, Paul, this is Paula. And I said, hey, we could do a song together. And she (laughs) she said, you know, I was named after that song. Oh, my gosh. I'm here in Kansas City. Uh, very shortly, we'll be singing at the reception of, of a man and a woman over in Lee Summit, Missouri. And his name is Paul, and her name is Paula. And they, they found out that I, the real thing was over here across town, and so they want me to come and sing. Wow. <laughs> I just, I've sung at more things, and, and more people have written me and told me that the very thing you're talking about, it, it's you know, it's a blessing and an honor more than anything else, Paul. Yeah. So tell us, when you had this newfound fame, how did you take it? It did come fast, and as I said, we went from fan to famous in about three months, and uh, if you don't have your life together, you're not going to get much of a break from anybody else. I mean, in our case, it just took off, and when you have a number one song, that means it's being played a lot by a lot of different stations. A lot of songs get up to number 30 or something like that, and they're maybe they're not being played that much, but 
ours was being played a lot, especially on the East Coast up in uh, New York and all of that, where 500-mile radius of Buffalo, New York, is half the population of the United States, and that's that's where our our song was a hit. And so it was tough. You got treated like a spoiled king, you know, all over the place. Everybody came to you with autographs and all. This was back, uh, you know, before computers and cell phones and all that kind of stuff. You know, in my case, I was a Christian guy, and I, I had some help from God. I don't know how people make it, I mean, because you just can't believe your press clippings. If you if you start believing every, what everybody says about you, you're the greatest thing it ever was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it's tough. So 